I'm very pleased to be here uh, at this great Mises University, the year 2008, and I understand from the authorities that we have 190 registered stu uh, students and faculty from 23 countries. Okay, uh, most of them are from the United States, but we have many students from non-rogue states also. <laughs> I feel somewhat funny addressing you on the thought of Ludwig von Mises. Um, as far as economics goes, all of our speakers are in a much better position to inform you on this subject than I am, except, of course, for, du for David Gordon, who's a blithering idiot. <laughs> <laughs> he, he applauded that, didn't he? <laughs> okay, most of you know, at least, uh, this great book of Guido Holtzmann. Okay. Uh, Mises, The Last Night of Liberalism. And uh, it's a magnificent work. I read it in the next, I think, the last draft before the final publication. Uh, illustrated, for those of you who agree with Alice, or what, what is the use of a book without pictures. Um, and it is not only the definitive work on the life and thought of uh, von Mises, but um, it is... Um, uh, a, a whole course of economic history, the history especially of the Austrian school, and history, the history of the times in general. This really could be called uh, the uh, life and times of Ludwig von Mises. So Guido Hülsmann would have been really maybe the logical candidate for uh, this talk on Mises and his, um, and his thought. Uh, all I can claim is that I was personally acquainted with Mises, and I've been f familiar with his work for a very long time. I was introduced to Mises' thought by my high school buddy, George Reisman, who'd already read Human Action when we were at the Bronx High School of Science. He read it, I think, when he was 15. Um, then, by some uh, chance of fate, we met Leonard Reed and his staff at the Foundation for Economic Education. And through Reed, we were invited to attend Mises', Mises seminar at New York University. That's where I first met Murray Rothbard, another fateful encounter, and a friend and um, inspiration until his untimely death. As soon as we entered college, George and I began an intensive study of German. These our neocon friends really have have a, a charming way of um, acting like total American bozos when uh, some foreign country refuses to get a, go into the, the war that America has started. So there's this P.J. O'Rourke, maybe you know him, he's at Cato Institute from time to time, and he said that German was a language suited to be able to spit into the face of the person you're talking to. <laughs> well, that's not what uh, George and I found. Uh, after a couple of years of college, uh, German he translated uh, Mises' book on the epistemological foundations of economics and another uh, work that Mises very much admired in the history of philosophy. And uh, I translated Mises' liberalism. Both translations modest, modestly supported um, by uh, the Volcker Fund. They didn't have much money. Uh, it was a, Volcker Fund was a, a small foundation that with uh, old right tendencies that supported um, uh, Murray Rothbard as well. And ever since then, I, um, I followed the vicissitudes of Mises' reputation and his work. I was interested to see that when he died in October 1973, even the New York Times, in its obituary, called him, uh, one of, quote, one of the foremost economists of this century. And later, Milton Friedman, although he's from a totally different positivist uh, tradition in economics, called Mises one of the great economists of all time. Um, typical graciousness, I would say, on Friedman's part. Uh, Mises' scientific achievements were indeed awesome. There is his pioneering work in monetary theory and the business cycle, 
going back to 1912. His profound work in the methodology of economics and the a priori derivation of economic truths, his systematizing of all economic theory and his magnum opus, human action. But I want to mention something that's not often um, understood. Um, Mises uh, was, throughout his whole life, of course he was a theoretical economist, and he speaks about a priori method in economics, but he was a profound student of history. Read history, well, from the, from, uh, uh, from the time he was a student. And it was his understanding of economic principles that enabled him to penetrate to the heart of crucial historical questions uh, when other uh, historians uh, really didn't know what was going on. And I'll, I'll just cite two examples. A question that has occupied economic historians in recon, recent decades, and there's a huge literature on the subject, is what's called the European miracle. Why did economic growth occur in the West and not elsewhere in the world? And uh, Mises, in, in one of his essays, uh, j this is just an aside uh, that uh, he has, Mises says, the idea of liberty is and always has been peculiar to the West. The East lacked the primor primordial thing, the idea of freedom from the state. It never called into question the arbitrariness of the despots. And first of all, it never established the legal framework that would protect the private citizen's wealth against, against confiscation on the part of tyrants. That's why in, uh, stories about the, like the Arabian Nights and so on, uh, somebody has a great fortune and is buried. Is buried and there are vipers and cobras and so on defending it. Uh, why? In, in, in Holland, somebody had a great fortune. He put it in, into herring boats for the herring trade. Well, the person in the Arabian Night story has to worry about the Grand Vizier or the Sultan or whoever, if he sees that somebody has a lot of money, simply confiscating the money. There was no guarantee for private property. Um, and the second, uh, uh, oh, by the way, as, as far as that goes, this insight of Mises is at the heart of the ex explanation of the European miracle that is given by, given, uh, by uh, Rosenberg and Birdsell and how the West grew rich, which is the best introduction. Douglas North of Washington University, who uh, got a Nobel Prize for it, and many others. Or take the question of the Industrial Revolution. As Hayek wrote, the myth of the immiseration of the working class in the Industrial Revolution is the supreme historical myth of socialism. It has done more than anything else to erode belief in the system of the free economy. Mises, however, pointed out uh, the uh, indispensable context that the Industrial Revolution occurred and uh, can only be judged um, in terms of the population explosion that had been going on. In other words, an, an immense increase in population. How were these new millions and tens of millions of people to be kept alive? And um, industrialization was the answer. In a, in, in a way, Ayn Rand was right. You know, they should bow down and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and bless these, uh, these uh, smoking uh, stacks of uh, factories. Here, here are some numbers. Uh, I'm not going to quiz you about this, so you don't have to take this down. The population of England in 1750 was 6 million. It had never been any more than that. That was the highest it had ever been. By 1800, it was 12 million. It had doubled. By 1850, it had doubled again. It was 24 million. And in 1900, the population was 42 million. How, how are these people going to be kept alive? As T.S. Ashton wrote... If you want to see a country that has experienced a population explosion without industrialization, then go to Calcutta. Uh, or, as we could say, go to Ireland in the 19th century. So my point is that Mises uh, was aware of all of this <coughs> um, on the basis of his uh, uh, economic and praxeological knowledge and pointed the way uh, that... Uh, uh, other, other historians, economic historians, are only now um, discovering. But 
I want to concentrate on another of his great contributions. At one time, people who called themselves socialists had an ideal and a goal. Now socialism, I don't even know what socialism means now, just constantly carping on the ever-changing critique uh, of um, the free market, uh, you know, pointing out, uh, pointing out um, uh, deficiencies in, uh, in consumers' choices, ridiculous confi- uh, choices uh, in, on the market. But, you know, you have to ask yourself whenever you see this, uh, what's the alternative? What do you want to do about it? Uh, how are you going to, what are you going to replace this uh, uh, private property system with? But the, this um, internal uh, impetus to just criticize, uh, keep criticizing the market, uh, ridiculing uh, uh, property owners uh, who uh, produce what pe- keeps people alive, it's amazing how long that's been going on. So, but, but years ago, they had a, the socialists had a definite program. It was a centrally planned economy. There was a rejection of the anarchy of the market, as they called it. And it was, they believed, the scientific wave of the future. This was the faith of thousands upon thousands of professional intellectuals in all countries. Uh, and you could name some of the greatest uh, names in art and, uh, and uh, science, even. For one example... You can just read Albert Einstein's article, Why Socialism. Uh, It's easily available on the web. This was Albert Einstein. And why socialism? Because capitalism is production for profit, and socialism is production for people. Okay? And that that is the tenor of this uh, extremely brilliant analysis. (laughs) Sometimes, as with Einstein, socialists did raise the possibility of excessive bureaucracy. One might also wonder how it would be possible to combine a centrally planned economy with a democracy uh, in any normal sense. Anyway, the socialists didn't deal with this. Um, And in any case, that wasn't the main problem. The main problem was the feasibility of abolishing private property in the first place. How can there be any rational economic calculation if there is no market for capital goods, as there cannot, cannot be under socialism, how would the scientific, the scientific, great engineering socialist planners know how to allocate capital? Capital has a number of competing uh, uses. Um, how, how could they do that? Well, as our Randy and friends might say, blank out. There are 40-plus volumes of the collected works of Marx and Engels. Uh, and uh, no more than a dozen pages are devoted, no more than a dozen pages are devoted in any sense to how a socialist uh, society uh, could operate. Uh, mostly Marx and Engels assumed uh, the Sassimonian idea of central planning and that it would encounter no problems. Otherwise, uh, all they do is they, pro- pro- they produce um, um, visions of the uh, inevitable future socialist uh, society where the the, uh, freedom of all would be the precondition for the freedom of each, whatever the hell. Uh, (laughs) That's in the the manifesto. And the the followers and socialists of all parties um, followed suit in the same way. um, It was Mises' accomplishment, a sign of his truly superb independence of mind to have brushed aside this pious taboo. This uh, one just doesn't speak of such things. Let's just wait. Let's overturn society and set up socialism and wait and see what happens. Uh, Instead, Mises uh, presented comprehensively and arrestingly the insoluble problems of socialist economic calculation. The socialists attempted some rebuttals. They argued for something called market socialism. There was a big debate at one time, and mainstream writers all said that Mises had been proven wrong, that socialism would work just fine. About 15 years ago, after the experience of the Soviet Union and all real existing socialism, the socialist economist 
Robert Halbrunner wrote, it turns out, of course, that Mises was right. Whoops. <laughs> I, I love that. I, I love that, of course. <laughs> Seventy years on the road to nowhere, as, um, as the workers uh, in Moscow and what was Leningrad used to hold up in signs as the, as the regime was uh, breaking down. The consequences of neglecting Mises can be seen in the history of the 20th century, in the tens of millions of diminished and destroyed lives, in Russia, in Poland, in Hungary, in China, and elsewhere. But um, Mises was virtually alone. Um, he lived um, in Vienna, um, but this, is, uh, this was no longer the Vienna of the of the great uh, art and music of, the, of Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, Schubert, etc., uh, whose patrons had been the monarchy and the aristocracy. Uh, now, democ and the church. Now, democracy had arrived uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, and um, now Vienna became the city that three times elected a violent anti-Semite as mayor. Uh, this man's name was Karl Luega. He was the original National Socialist. He was a nationalist and uh, preached hatred of the Slavic peoples and of the Jews. Um, and he was a socialist, not in the, in the sense of, uh, of uh, 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 taking over um, uh, banks and so on, but in the sense of welfare socialism. He built uh, housing projects uh, for uh, the German working class, uh, there were maternity uh, uh, benefits, there were educational uh, opportunities, anything that could uh, help the masses of people, and he was re-elected. Um, Hitler lived in Vienna at that time, and Hitler was, was uh, his, his worldview was shaped by this man, Karl Luega. And if you go to uh, Vienna, there's still a Karl Luega Platz. It's in the, the great Ringstrasse, where all the great uh, monuments, or well, many of the great monuments of Vienna can be found. And there, there's, a car, there's this, this plaza uh, dedicated to the memory of this character, Karl Lueger. Viennese are funny people. Uh, when the socialists were in charge, they kicked out the aristocrats. When the Nazi, Nazis came in, they kicked out the Jews. And what you have is, is a residue. Um, <laughs> But this, but um, uh, this in the 20s and 30s, this is the Vienna Mises lived in. You can imagine his position. Uh, here was Mises. He was the grandson of the high rabbi of Lemberg. Not only a Jew, but uh, almost an equal uh, sin in the minds of the, uh, of, his, <laughs> of the people and also his colleagues at the university. Uh, he was already the leading classical liberal east of the Rhine and maybe the last authentic liberal in Europe. So Mises was isolated. But as he wrote in his memoirs, I would not lose courage even now. I would not tire in professing what I knew to be right. So he decided to write a book on socialism, which I contemplated before the, the war. I now set about executing my old, my old plan. That book was, was Socialism, it appeared in 1922. This book found its remnant, if you know the uh, uh, Albert J. Knox concept of the, of the remnant, uh, those who in each generation are attracted by, this, by these ideas, almost you could say instinctively attracted, and, uh, and will absorb them and pass them on. Now, an edition, a late edition of the uh, of socialism was uh, published by Liberty Press, and that'd be the one to get because uh, their uh, uh, their production values are very high and they don't charge very much. And Hayek wrote the introduction, and he explained in the introdu introduction. This is what he said: When socialism first appeared, its impact was profound. That, that is when his book, uh, Mises' book, Socialism, first appeared. It gradually but fundamentally altered the outlook of many of the young idealists returning to their university studies after the 
First World War. A number of my contemporaries who later became well known, but who were then unknown to each other, went through the same experience. Uh, Wilhelm Röpke in Germany, uh, who was the advisor to Adenauer and Erhardt when the time came for the, uh, Europe, the German uh, miracle after the Second World War, Lionel Robbins in England, uh, were, but, were but two examples, and then Hayek also. These men, these men and others that could be mentioned were um, instrumental in the rebirth of classical liberalism in the 20th century. Mises' influence was spread through his famous seminar in Vienna, which included many thinkers who went on to achieve international eminence. And he continued to write for the rest of his life. Uh, the book I tr uh, translated, uh, was called Liberalism, was published in 1927. Translation has gone through a number of uh, n different names since it was first published in 1962, but it has never gone out of print for, you know, whatever, decades. The work is short, but an excellent introduction to Mises' social philosophy. What stands out is that Mises places at the very head of the liberal program the first thing he talks about is private property. And there's a reason for that. Marx and Engels have stated in the, in the Communist Manifesto, they wrote that the theory of communism can be summed up in one expression, the abolition of private property. So in liberalism, Mises begins with private property and maintains all that the rest of the liberal theory that follows, liberty, peace, and all the other principles, follow from it, from this principle of private property. This distinguished Mises boldly from all the rest of the writers who are now calling themselves liberals. They had hijacked the name of liberal, but in reality were nothing more than social democrats in disguise. So why was Mises ignored for so many years? I mentioned all the contributions over the years, the decades. At his seminar at NYU, uh, at New York University, for instance, the university didn't even pay a salary. Salary was paid by the Volcker Fund. Just as at Chicago, the university did not pay Hayek's salary. It was paid by an outside foundation. In fact, Hayek could not even get a job in the economics department at Chicago, the department of Milton Friedman and George Stigler, because uh, these uh, gentlemen did not consider Hayek to be a scientific economist. Uh, still, whenever, uh, but he could, afterwards Hayek received the Nobel Prize in economics. Whenever um, uh, the Nobel uh, uh, Prize is, uh, is um, announced each year, uh, Chicago, University of Chicago takes out a full page ad in the Times, as Harvard does also in MIT and so on, and lists the Nobel Prizes by its different that received by people had some connection with Chicago, and they list Hayek winning the economics prize, and it's open anybody to conclude that the, the economics department gave him the prize. Uh, when um, when Bill Buckley started his career many years ago of college lecturing, of college debating, he liked to debate. Um, he, would, um, he would begin by, by, often, by writing two names on the blackboard. And one was the name of some uh, leftist or socialist writer that was, was popular at the time or that most people would recognize, uh, Kenneth Galbraith or John Dewey or, or whoever it might be and asked how many people recognize this name. And almost everybody put up their hands. I mean, this is self-selected group of people who are interested in political questions. And then he wrote down the name of Ludwig von Mises and how many people had heard of him. Well, almost nobody had. Buckley's point was, how is it in the great debate between socialism on the one hand and the free enterprise and uh, capitalist system on the other hand, you have only been exposed to the ideas of one side. Mises was the culmination 
of a tradition that went back to the, sixth, to the 17th and 18th centuries, and that included some, uh, well, fairly um, notable names, uh, like uh, Adam Smith and uh, Turgot and, uh, and Thomas Jefferson, uh, John Locke for that matter, and uh, Benjamin Constant, Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, many people in the uh, Lord Acton, and you'd think, and, and, and people who knew the, what the, uh, the subject of classical liberalism recognized that, hit, that uh, Mises was now the uh, representative of this tradition. But the college professors could not find the time. I mean, they, 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 they uh, have students read stuff by Walter Lippmann, uh, really one of the great uh, uh, and, and, uh, seminal uh, thinkers of, of the time. He was a columnist of the damn, uh, what was it, the Herald Tribune. Uh, but they couldn't find the time to introduce the, uh, the thought of Le Duc von Mises. Well, I guess, you know, there was a reason for that. And that is, by the way, where is this? Yeah, you can look up, I don't know if they still have copies of this available, one of the best articles on uh, Mises is, a, is an essay by Lou called Heart of a Fighter. Um, you, you, it's in the July 2005 issue of the Free Market. And it, it, naturally, it's online. And they might even have hard copies here. Heart of, the Heart of a Fighter. It's about the Mises and the character of Mises. And um, I think, well, Lou uh, has, a, has a, lot, um, a lot of good insights there. So, well, Mises kept on with his work. You know, somehow the, the, he was impervious to, um, to the uh, uh, rest of the world. Seemed to be, didn't seem to dent him at all. At NYU, he had a handful of students, uh, of PhD students. Well, select. So among them were Hans Zenholz, Israel Kirzner, and George Reisman. But what could account for this lack of respect for Mises? He was never uh, elected president of the American Economic Association. Um, they gave him uh, belatedly a Lifetime Achievement Award. But as I say, he was never a, a tenured professor anywhere. And, uh, I mean, people, you guys know something about, um, about your professors and professors in general. Can you imagine the kind of people who become tenured professors thousands and th tens of thousands around the country and they couldn't find a position for Mises or Hayek. Um, but what would account for this lack of respect uh, shown to Mises? I, uh, there was a, a French economist uh, really quite uh, uh, um, distinguished in his time, uh, supporter of the gold standard, a close economic advisor to uh, de Gaulle uh, named Jacques Rueff. And uh, there was there was a uh, a feshrift uh, that is a collection of uh, of essays on some particular occasion uh, for Mises. I think uh, it was on the occasion of his of his the 60th occasion of his doctorate, something like that. Yeah. And so Jacques Rueff, his essay was entitled "The Intransigence of Ludwig von Mises." Intransigence. That's a good word. Mises never budge, budged an inch. He never gave an inch, as all the changing fads came and went, captured the loyalty of generation after generation of intellectuals, from militarism and imperialism, and they were, uh, they were going to hold for imperialism in every country before the First World War. Fascism, they were very distinguished, um, well, some economists, but also just intellectuals in general, who became fascists. Keynesianism, of course, every variety of socialism, and uh, Mises stood up uh, against it. Um, he was a doctrinaire, they say. Well, dogmatist. Um, it seems to me that... Um, see, Hayek was a great man. He was the head of my dissertation committee at, at um, Chicago. But they, these um, people who are the gatekeepers, you could say, 
for uh, who, whose uh, reputation flourishes and who, who doesn't, whose doesn't. Uh, they were uh, they were more um, favorable to marginally more favorable to Hayek than to Mises. Um, Mises, Mises uh, held high the banner of laissez-faire, and Hayek didn't care for that word. Um, he uh, proposed various uh, um, interventions that were incompatible with laissez-faire. Uh, Hayek was altogether more clubbable in the uh, in the English uh, sense, that is, uh, or the uh, salon fait, as the uh, Germans would say, the sort of person that you would invite to your high tea. Um, uh, uh, and, and and well, to take an example, Hayek d dedicated uh, the Road to Serfdom, which is his most popular book, to socialists of all parties. Mises wouldn't do anything like that. Mises hated these people. <laughs> he didn't, you know, it's maybe not a Christian thing to do. It, it, he didn't just hate socialism, he hated socialists. <laughs> um, dedicating a book to socialists of all parties, that would be like um, Ayn Rand dedicating Atlas Shrugged to uh, thugs of all descriptions. <laughs> it's not something you would expect. Well, Mises lives on in the in the in this great institute, spread to many to, new thousands of people by the work of uh, Lou Rockwell and his staff. It shaped the the thinking very strongly. Shaped the thinking of Ron Paul. Nobody start chanting Ron, Ron Paul, Ron Paul, Ron Paul. Okay. I had enough of that during. The <laughs> and you know, look where it got us. <laughs> Um, but nonetheless, uh, and through Ron Paul, you know, many other thousands of people now. I'm sure, I haven't seen his book on, uh, on the revolution. Uh, have you seen it yet? Does he mention Mises? Yeah. Yeah, well, okay. I mean, that's another example. Um, when I first uh, learned of the title of Guido's book, uh, Mises, The Last Night of Liberalism, I was a little puzzled. But eventually... I think I, I understood. There's come, there has come down to us from the Middle Ages uh, a description of the perfect night of uh, courtly uh, of, of feudalism, the, of the perfect Christian night, a night without fear and without reproach. Ritter on a furcht und tadel, chevalier sans peur et sans reproche. This is what Mises was, filled with courage from the beginning to the end, with an intellectual adamantine, another good word, intellectual integrity that remains an inspiration to us and to those who will come after us. One last thing I'll say, uh, one of the good things in my life has been that I've met some very smart people. Uh, Murray, of course, uh, Robert Nozick, Ayn Rand, uh, Milton Friedman, uh, Hayek, but Mises remains in my, in my memory as the uh, very type of a uh, fearless, brilliant, creative intellectual. Thank you.